I, I think I'm up against pretty stiff competition this block of time, and I appreciate you all uh, coming. My name is Don Waters, uh, and I have been uh, working as a CNI senior scholar for the last uh, year or so, and um, been working on the issue of uh, societal grand challenges and what kind of uh, information infrastructure can libraries, IT organizations, and others provide to advance uh, research on these kinds of questions. And I can't think of a better way uh, to orient you to societal grand challenges than to refer you to the literature on the apocalypse. Um, and uh, really, no better reference than the book of Revelations. Um, and all of the horsemen are very active these days. I'm gonna focus on uh, the wild beast of climate change. Climate changes are long-term shifts in atmospheric and oceanic temperatures and in related weather patterns. It's the simplest definition I could find. Um, and the findings, um, there have been over the last year, huge, uh, national assessments of, and UN assessments of progress on uh, climate change research. And among the conclusions, there is incontrovertible evidence for the unequivocal conclusion that the cause of current climate changes is man-made. And the primary cause is the burning of fossil fuels beginning with the deployment of the steam engine uh, in the 1750s. Among the findings, the, uh, the highest levels, we now are experiencing the highest levels of greenhouse gas, gases uh, in 800,000 years. Temperature increases in the last 50 years were greater than those in the last 2,000 years. Sea levels rose uh, in the 20th century more than they have in the last 30 centuries. And the drought in the western U U.S., which may or may not be over, was more severe and long-lasting uh, than any other in uh, 1,200 years. Given these findings, um, 15,000 scientists recently signed a declaration that we are facing not an urgent problem, but a climate emergency. And there is huge frustration among these scientists at global inaction. They feel that they are screaming into the void, uh, as one author uh, of one of the recent assessments put it. And some have threatened uh, to halt all further uh, scientific work uh, until there's action. Why keep reproducing uh, the finding that we have an emergency? Others have said, what's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if in the end all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come true? Another, if you said, Let's design a problem that human institutions can't deal with. You couldn't find a better one than global warming. So what's to be done? There's recent studies, um, one of them uh, at uh, Ithaca SNR, and Ithaca has uh, mastered an approach to identify and document research university organizational strategies. And in one of those reports, uh, among the top university priorities they identified was addressing issues of broad public concern and doing so by uh, investing in STEM. That report and subsequent one reports asked, are library strategies aligned with these university priorities? So uh, will STEM save us from the apocalypse as suggested in this report? For war, we have armaments and surveillance from the science uh, genetic engineering for famine, vaccines for pestilence, and for the wild beast, let's lower greenhouse gas emissions. It's just one problem. STEM research is necessary, but demonstrably insufficient to fully address the problems re represented by the four horsemen. There was a massive uh, investment uh, in STEM effort to uh, develop vaccines, but there were huge differential outcomes, especially for marginalized groups 
both before and after the vaccines became available. Similarly for uh, climate change, uh, climate scientists have produced amazing findings, but this frustration persists. And why is that? For these broad social grand challenges, research universities need to make a special kind of investment that they haven't really yet made. And they need to tune their information support structures accordingly. We know reliably that disasters will occur but are, st are still uncertain about when and where. So the science is not exactly um, uh, complete. Social scientists have called this issue um, predictable surprises, and they're driving researchers to understand climate, climate dynamics even more, not at a global level, but to keep focusing down on the issues at local levels. And yet, there is a, this persistent level of uncertainty is part of the reason why the public uh, resists investing in remedies. The uncertainties also fuel um, active opposition that seeks to raise doubts about and even deny the existence of climate change. As, and it also feeds uh, disinformation campaigns uh, such as ClimateGate. You may re remember this in. Uh, Around 2009, uh, there was a uh, hack job in uh, a climate institute in the UK. They stole the emails and uh, cherry-picked them, uh, allegedly to demonstrate that uh, the scientists had made up their data. Moreover, the push for local research uh, to keep uh, pushing on the science requires special skills because deploying sensors and other um, uh, investigations in local uh, communities just raises suspicions and you need the special skills to allay those. These kinds of frustrations are characteristic of um, what's called a wicked problem. Um, detailed STEM research is not enough there's a psychological disposition in part because of uh, the insufficient research uh, to avoid um, uh, uncertainty and invo avoid investment. There's a, economic calculations about the perceived risk that suggest, well, let's not make the investment now, we'll wait and see if it, uh, the issues are resolved further. And then there, of course, as I just mentioned, the politics and culture of resistance. Wickedness um, is a concept from complexity studies. It doesn't mean wicked as an evil, and it's not wicked in the Bostonian sense of she's a wicked or very smart, but it's also not complex like a moonshot where there is a clear measure of success when you either land on the moon or you miss it. A problem is wicked when it's hard to define. Uh, the originator of the term talked about uh, viciousness like a circle. And it lacks clear solutions, tricky like a leprechaun, uh, the author said. That is, the components of this particular problem, climate change, um, the components of the problem and the solution are interlocking systems, physical, biochemical, political, legal, economic, psychological, chemical, and others. And the problem may be defined in terms of oceanic and atmospheric variables, biochemical and physical. But it, the, the problem takes a different shape if it's viewed from the perspective of social and cultural systems. For wicked problems, normal science um, uh, is, is not sufficient, a different kind is needed. And it's philosophers of science, historians of science have called this post-normal science or mode two uh, knowledge production. I'm not advocating those names, that's just what they use. Um, it requires, and, and their, their argument is that it requires interdisciplinary research that includes expertise from STEM, social science, and humanities disciplines. 
and the effect, and also in, needs to include affected communities outside of academia. A workshop uh, in 2016 on university-led grand challenges attracted 20 universities, and that workshop called for a paradigm shift among universities to support wicked problem research. It recommended, in addition to the issues of um, interdisciplinarity and engaging in um, uh, community-engaged research, leveraging centers and institutes. The research I've done over the last uh, year or so um, has produced a number of examples uh, that illustrate how this kind of um, process works. I started with um, interviewed researchers affiliated with climate change uh, centers and institutes, plus administrators and librarians and other information specialists for a total of uh, 44 individuals in 12 R1 and R R2 universities. This is not meant to be comprehensive, but it was suggestive, and I'll give you some uh, wonderful examples of the kind of research uh, that's uh, underway in these kinds of institutes. Uh, a sociologist reported that with the data specialist, um, she's identifying and mapping the location over time of chemical waste left by industry as well as small businesses such as gas stations and car rent repair shops and then documenting changes in the, in the use of that land and tracing the cultural, political, and economic effects that led to mitigating, and in many cases, concealing the hazards. An engineer in urban planning uh, is engaged, um, and this is one of my, more f one of my favorite examples, uh, in partnership with uh, state office of, the State Office of Climate and Energy and with zoning officers in dozens of communities around the state and is scraping websites to collect and analyze uh, zoning ordinances uh, to determine how local uh, communities regulate and deploy uh, solar and wind power. And you can imagine that there's a lot of uh, NIMBYs uh, in that uh, group. But the idea of scraping websites was of particular interest. Uh, in collaboration with uh, data scientists and um, community data sources, a historian uh, is gathering uh, scientific documentation of weather events, local community disaster declarations, and insurance data to eval evaluate locations across the country as possible climate havens. An engineer, as part of a team uh, including an aerospace engineer and air traffic controllers, uh, is redesigning landing, takeoff, and taxiing routes to conserve fuel. Conservation ecologists uh, working with various stakeholders, including indigenous communities uh, in co coastal North Carolina, is identifying local values and perspectives, and then trying to integrate those into tools for the local communities to make decisions about whether and how to preserve cultural monuments like lighthouses, uh, that are endangered by weather events and rising sea levels. Political scientists, uh, in collaboration with an ecologist in local indigenous communities in Arctic re regions, is co-developing strategies to understand local climate change and possible mitigation and adaption strategies, adaptation strategies. Then a law professor in an urban area is, uh, has partnerships in that urban area and in other cities uh, with local community stakeholders and university researchers and is creating laboratories for governing the city as a commons and focusing partic participants in the lab on how to address climate changes and environmental justice. So if the university's priority is to support research like this on wicked problems, then how do librarians and other information specialists align their strategies to this priority? I'm coming up with four suggested uh, adjustments, and I'll go over them in more detail. First, uh, to focus on research in university-supported centers and institutes that are devoted to wicked problem research. The second is to foster skills needed for inter interdisciplinary research. Third, support local communities in defining and co-producing uh, research on climate change. 
and then finally enhance the data support to accommodate the nature and scale of interdisciplinary and public contributions. So let's start with the recommendation about centers and institutes. Libraries have generally re relied on a liaison model uh, for research support. The liaison role is based on the traditional subject librarian, uh, but there's been a lot of experimentation over the last couple of decades, um, particularly focused on whether there should be sub subject expertise or some kind of functional expertise uh, uh, in, uh, in embodied in this liaison role. And uh, in medical librarianship, the idea of the informationist as uh, uh, an information partner to a clinical team has also um, gotten a lot of traction. Despite the ex experimentations, liaisons mainly interact with departments, and for good reason. Departments are, as one observer puts it, the essential and irreplaceable building blocks of the university. They provide the disciplinary home for faculty. They manage appointments, tenure and promotions, course assignments, and they confer degrees. Centers and institutes complement departments and serve as research units. However, they are relatively easy to create, hard to eliminate, and there's often a dizzying array of them. Uh, when I was at Mellon, we had a uh, university president come and uh, declare that every faculty member wanted an institute or a center. And I think he was, and he certainly was right. Um, many of those uh, centers are simply the labs uh, of the researcher or the individual faculty member and uh, for his or her graduate students. Others are for specific uh, projects created at the behest of a funder or industry sponsor. Universities generally recognize the value of these various kinds of centers and institutes, but they do give special attention to others, such as those that are devoted to climate change. For librarians and IT specialists to allocate liaisons and other um, research support to these kinds of centers or institutes, what kind of distinguishing uh, criteria should they look for? Turns out that I came across a, um, a study, two studies actually, of um, these climate change uh, institutes and centers, and they identified uh, these criteria. So I'm uh, quoting from these reports. Uh, a director uh, reporting to the provost or vice president for research, a formal mission and strategic plan for wicked problem research, a stable budget for staff and seed funding, a schedule for regular convenings to share work, and faculty participation from a variety of disciplines. Uh, I learned uh, in talking with uh, the directors of the institutes uh, that I was interviewing um, that this, this, this set of criteria are the basis uh, for a lot of competition among them. They are developing their own strategic plans against uh, other centers along these criteria. Do we have a director that's reporting up into the administration? Um, where is our budget and what is it and how stable is it? Is the university committed or not? So let me turn uh, now to uh, interdisciplinarity. Knowledge often advances uh, when researchers work together at or across uh, the edges of their areas of expertise. This is a well-known uh, observation. Centers and institutes that address wicked problems must fo foster work across disciplinary boundaries. It, it is a critical um, feature of these kinds of institutes. Historians and philosophers of science have identified various kinds of work across disciplinary boundaries, but these are the main types. Multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity. Again, there are others, but I, uh, these are the, the main ones that appear in the literature. And the key factor uh, that distinguishes among these is the level of integration. Multidisciplinarity um, 
In, in multidiscipline uh, work, there is a coordination of research simply by juxtaposition data uh, of data methods and concepts. Interdisciplinarity, uh, there's a, an integration of data tools and concepts to achieve certain results. And then transdisciplinarity uh, is the greatest level of inter integration where the approaches are merged together to achieve new concepts and methods. The level of integration depends at least in part on the intellectual proximity of the fields. Uh, Chris and I benefited from your recent article on proximity and distance um, in this, on this point. Uh, the closer the fields, the greater the chance of uh, transdisciplinary breakthroughs. Um, think of biochemistry, um, but you're not going to see that uh, with uh, biology and history necessarily. Um, and although funders regularly push for transdisciplinary um, advances, um, doing so for wicked problem research may be actually be counterproductive. Exposure to distant fields uh, may be more informative, and caution is especially needed to avoid um, what's called disciplinary capture, uh, where values, concepts, or methods um, by researchers in one field are uh, taken uh, as prior or better than uh, those in other and often poorly funded uh, fields. There are two key information support requirements for research across disciplinary boundaries. Conceptual translation uh, is the first. Metadata specialists can help create lingua francas, um, which uh, Dan Reed referred to uh, in his uh, opening talk. Uh, and, they, uh, and in doing so, may need to reimagine or repair existing uh, metadata structures. Methodological integration um, uh, also um, is, a, is another requirement in key functional domains um, text, for textual material, audiovisual material, spatial and uh, numerical analysis, and, um, and so on. On the engagement side, let me talk, turn now to engagement. The standard uh, tripartite university mission is research, teaching, and service. But by engagement, I don't mean service. It's that service is different from scholarly engagement, which recognizes the value of different and usually practical or indigenous modes of knowledge. And it treats communities bearing uh, this knowledge not as objects of study, but as participants who help determine what to study and how. The types of relevant communities include, and I've mentioned these in my examples, uh, local residents with deep understanding of lo local climate change and their effects, owners or custodians of endangered cultural heritage, industry partners responsible for controlling emissions, underrepresented communities that are downwind, downstream, or otherwise harmed uh, by uh, climate change. The specific examples included air traffic controllers, custodians of uh, coastal cultural heritage, indigenous communities in the Arctic, uh, and residents of urban neighborhoods. For these kinds of groups and for this kind of engagement, the information uh, support requirements um, are similar to those for interdisciplinarity, conceptual translation and methodological integration. However, in this case, value conflicts often turn out to be the key information issue, where um, the conflicts are in conceptual definitions, methodological approaches, and they can often be very complicated and time-consuming to resolve. Um, one of uh, the people I talked to said that often you have to just start from scratch with first principles uh, when you're engaging uh, uh, communities at this level. To build trust, special efforts may be, ne may be needed, for example, to make uh, academic climate models 
more easily accessible, and some of the centers that I talked to were doing this. Um, care is also needed in the creation and management of community generated knowledge, community-based archives, and so on. And there's one big caution that I uh, was advised of during my interviews. The funding requirements for uh, engaging local communities can lead to carpetbagging, uh, where PIs uh, parachute in, um, check the box by asking to talk to a local uh, leader, and then they leave and in the process have ruined uh, a long-built trusted relationship. Uh, there's a, quite a lot of anger uh, that I picked up, uh, especially among those working with indigenous communities. Many, um, it's okay, so finally let's turn to uh, data support. Many climate scientists will continue to follow uh, discipline-based models of research. Uh, they will avail themselves of university, national, and international uh, infrastructures for big science data to build, um, refine, circulate uh, their climate models. And they will also rely on appropriate repositories to meet fair standards and uh, data management requirements. But researchers who participate in university-supported climate change centers and institute raise an additional set of data support issues. There are fundamental issues already discussed of translation, methodological integration, and value alignment associated with interdisciplinarity and community engagement. But in addition, climate change centers and institutes concentrate researchers across disciplines around a problem. And this concentration is an advantage. It provides an opportunity to avoid one-off support and to scale efforts to harden the local infrastructure of tools and methods for data gathering uh, and analysis. Research centers are generally unable to offer support um, for the research process, at least the ones I talk to, uh, and researchers complain to me about reproducibility problems, almost uniformly calling for professional help uh, in data gathering and analysis. With concentration in a center across disciplines, it provides an opportunity for uh, libraries and other inform uh, information support um, agencies to provide relatively efficient um, responses. A problem, this problem oriented concentration implies a shared interest in certain data types, text, numerical, spatial, um, AV, and for uh, methods of analysis, anal analyzing uh, these data. And there's a corresponding opportunity here to concentrate professional expertise and build, test, and harden um, the infrastructure of tools uh, and methods by working on, with this group focused on uh, certain data uh, structures. And the center also provides uh, a platform for introducing new tech such as um, AI, digital twins uh, methods, uh, in one place across the variety of fields. So it's a w an efficient method of um, providing uh, support. So I would say, ha running through those four um, key issues, I recognize that librarians and IT specialists have gained many of these skills um, for supporting climate change centers already in interdisciplinarity, public engagement, and data in their support for digital scholarship, public humanities, and, uh, and data management. The recommendations here recognize uh, the resource limitations uh, in universities and call for relatively modest adjust adjustments and extensions in these service strategies. Um, focusing on centers, again, support for interdisciplinarity, public engagement, uh, and data support. So my question for you, and uh, are, do you think these adjustments are feasible, and would they have desirable effects? So thank you for your attention.
please. Sure. Well, um, let me, the kinds of examples that I ran into with multidisciplinarity is that the research center would hold a luncheon every couple of weeks and invite people from uh, participants in the center um, to talk about the research, uh, to expose other um, researchers in other disciplines to what they're up to, what they're doing. It's an exposure. Um, it's not an actual integration in that sense. Um, interdisciplinarity. Um, a, a good example of uh, that is some, I, and I gave some of those, where um, there are two types of um, discipline working on the same problem. Um, a data scientist, an engineer, and um, an historian, and so on. Uh, and in order to address the problem, they have to come to some common understanding of the problem, of the data they're gathering and working with. Uh, and then uh, transdisciplinarity, I think, is a harder thing to imagine, although we've got good examples in, say, the sciences, and across, um, across the humanities, too, where there are gender studies that have, you know, where there have been mergers across fields to produce a new field, in effect. Um, and that's a different um, kind of integration. Does that help? Yeah. Chris. Right. Well, that's, that's partly what I'm um, calling for. Uh, if, if librarians and IT folks want to support this kind of wicked research, it is, in a, it is a commitment. Um, and you have to get down into the, um, um, the dirty business of what do these concepts mean and how do you reconcile them. Uh, and it, it, yeah, it's not a superficial process. And the call here is, you know, for if we're going to make advance on climate change and we all want to be a part of that, there is some dirty work to be done. And the, and the vehicle to do that would be through these centers where you're concentrating uh, the researchers rather than in departments where you have to kind of deal with people on a one-off basis. Brian? Good question. <laughs> well, I it's true. I <laughs> right, which which is kind of why I picked that. <laughs> um, but you're right, and I think that's that is a mission problem for the university is you know to be publicly engaged or to deal with public problems. Um, we've got to create an infrastructure for that, and one of the things to do is create these centers, and it's not just name a center, you've got to put the support behind it, which is why I listed those criteria. So then the first recommendation really is focus on centers of interest and, and frankly, create 
<laughs> Very good. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I I hear you on this this, and I I will give this some more thought in my um, report. Um, one of I, I'm I was reluctant to give names of institutions, but one of them uh, was um, well, since there's so few of them in the state, it's the University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, and I think they have like two or three librarians, uh, and. Uh, and, the, and a governor who is just relentlessly cutting the budget of the institution. And yet, in the center, there was uh, these uh, data support specialists that had done this phenomenal job of making the climate model accessible. I think you're absolutely right. It's not, I mean, that's not institutionally feasible there, and I, the, the complaints were just vehement. Um, about the lack of support. And further, even in interinstitutional collaboration was a problem for them uh, because they have no internet connection or no um, pipeline for the internet. They have a local internet, of course, but they retrieve data models and carry them back. They're a, a, sat a center for satellite transmissions of climate data, and they communicate those data by sneaker wear. They get on a plane with a, a suitcase full of um, data drives and carry it back to the lower 48, they said. <laughs> so it's a, it, I recognize the problem. I encountered it. I don't have a great solution. I don't think they did either. But I do hear you, and it's it, worth some further thought. Yes? Um, I, I didn't, not in this case, um, part, and it may just be the boundaries of the problem that I'm focused on is that, um, but the kind of engagement that I saw was very similar to this kind of citizen science, um, and particularly if you're thinking um, of indigenous communities who have their own um, model and perception of the relationship of the society to the nature. Um, 
and documenting that is an issue. Um, and how you, how they document it so that it's not, I'm studying you and I'm gonna put my kind of layer of interpretation on how I perceive that. Um, very good question. I didn't see good examples of it. Um, um, but it's, again, worth looking for them because uh, this whole idea of engagement is very closely related to the idea of citizen science. Um, go ahead, Dan. I, I was just thinking that it, it's also in the public humanities, too. You, you see examples of these kinds of things. Um, and I, there are so few humanists involved in this research, and they should be. I picked up you know, some historians and um, uh, philosophers and so on, but uh, this, is, this is an area where there needs to be a lot more work. Go ahead, Dan. Right. <laughs> Right. As you noted, and, um, and I'm especially worried, um, not to be too present, presentist, but um, you know, research universities are being noted as left now, you know, mm -hmm. left wing libraries, which had been a neutral entity, are now also being coded right. largely in the public as right. left entities. Maybe they want to be, but that's how they're being coded, and that creates resistance among constituents to these ideas we need to reach. And so I'm worried about just the overall almost like social psychology that we're dropping this into and how we can do some serious work in that area as librarians, as academics, to complement this or to, in a sense, like ensure or facilitate this work so that it works in the real world. Well, I, I think um, I, I may have came across as too sympathetic to uh, the scientists on their frustrations. Um, and in my report, I, I'm, I'm spending more time on the issue of how do you get humanists involved and why. And I think that's exactly the issue is that, you know, there is a history. Um, there is a communication strategy to be had on this and involving them in the research can be beneficial to the science as well as to addressing the overall problem. Um, and I was short on that, but I, I, I completely agree with you and need and take your point and we'll try to do um, more in the report on that topic. Um, but I also don't think it's simply a communication problem. Um, yeah. You know, there's more going on and having political scientists involved um, and so on is not a bad idea either. Um, who understand th those kinds of dynamics. Um, but yes, they need to be involved and they need to be involved for the kinds of questions that came up about funding and citizen science and so on. Um, but yeah, thank you. Yes?
um, I'll bet there is. And I think the danger is this kind of checkbox men mentality. Okay, I checked that box, but, you know, and then you get this disciplinary capture. I've got the money. You follow my ideas. Um, so that's, uh, I, I think that's an issue. And um, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to address this report to funders. I, you know, this is mainly to the CNI community, but I hope there will, maybe there's room for me to s make those kinds of suggestions. Um, and it's gotta be more than a checkbox. Yes. Yes. The priority of where the question comes from, and I thought that was really a unique uh, approach. I I came across a number of visionary VPRs um, like that, and the idea of asking the humanists to stand up, or or researcher from humanists humanistic fields to stand up and define the problem uh, is something that I think it was uh, Chris Newfield, who was the president of MLA last year, his, his presidential address is exactly that point, um, that folks in, in humanistic fields, researchers in humanistic fields have to stand up and start defining the problem rather than complaining about the lack of funding and so on. Well, I'm not going to say that, but I, I'm, I'm reporting what I understood Chris Newfield to say in his address. Uh, we, we're out of time, actually, but let's take these last two questions. Uh, you first. So along, along those lines, I really like that, that sort of leadership and visioning approach. And, and I think that that is Absolutely. Well, you're certainly right that um, not every institution is focused on climate change. Um, and there are other of these kinds of problems that they are focused on. Some are not focused on any of them. Um, I do worry about the mechanism of getting that agenda. Um, uh, it's, you know, it is a European model, to quote Dan Reed from his talk, is that kind of top-down approach is very European in its... Um, structure. Oh, top, down, right. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Brian, did you have a question? We, or we should. Yeah. 
Thank you so much.